Should Christians drink? Is alcohol a sin? Drink it. It's not sinful. We're supposed to be sober. Well, Jesus drank wine. How do you drink as a Catholic Christian? With your mouth. Receive freedom in Jesus' name right now. Drinking alcohol a sin? There's no way you can make a case from the Bible to show that drinking is a sin. Now, I know some people would say that depends what you're drinking. I drank, I drank today. I drank water. I had a mixed drink today. I had water with some lemon and some lime in it. What does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? Hello, I'm Michael Beverly. Thanks for watching. So I want to use the dispute over alcohol as a teaching and lesson that you can inject any other dispute into, and it falls much the same way. Stick around if you're a Christian who has some curiosity or you're facing some doubts about your faith and you'd like to explore more. What does the Bible say about fill in the blank? The dispute about alcohol among well-meaning, loving, intelligent Christians is indicative of disputes in Christianity as a whole, including the nature of the Trinity, the div divinity of Jesus, original sin, total depravity, predestination, free will, justification by faith alone, or is works involved, authority of scripture versus tradition, the nature of the church, the nature of the role of women or, and or divorcees in the church, who can be a leader, who can administer sacraments, the sacraments and the ordinance, things like baptism, infant baptism, the role of Mary and the saints, eschatology, ecclesiology, charismatic gifts, healings, tongues, prophetic words, the Eucharist, Creation versus evolution, the age of the universe. Homosexuality, same-sex marriage, the role of gays in the church, divorce and remarriage, salvation outside of Christianity universalism, as well as things like diet, fasting, tattoos, the length of men's hair, women's dress, makeup. What does it actually mean to not give the appearance of evil? These questions and many more can, could be tackled and looked at exactly the way we're going to look at alcohol and drinking of alcohol in the church. Stick around. Let's see what Christians have to say. What does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? So he wants the color of pink. Oh. I have the drunken orgies. Debauchery is basically going buck wild. <laughs> so he wants the color of pink. I have, I have what's the color of pink. I, the other day I was downing a chocolate milkshake. Oh, let it all go. And as I was downing it, I was thinking, this is so nice. How can anyone drink beer? Ray needs to realize that people have different tastes, like different things. Some people like mustard. Some people like sushi. So please check out our sponsor. This book is addresses that very issue. People can like different flavors of things. And it's okay to have different tastes. I think alcohol drinking is wonderful. I, I, I think God is for it. I think it's commanded in the Old Testament, dude. <laughs> Drinking alcohol normally masks a deeper problem. I can give you a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about alcohol and masking our feelings. Booze. Hooch. The hard stuff. Grandpa's cough medicine. Is it okay for a Christian to drink alcohol? In fact, by the way, I, I had these in here, but I felt like it was a little too much. There are 75 different warnings against alcohol in the Bible. Did you know that? 75 different warnings against the effects and consequences of alcohol. Here I think it's commanded in the Old Testament. Does the Bible allow for Christians, that is, followers of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, to drink alcoholic beverages? Alcohol can create a chemical dependency. What does the Bible say about alcohol? We I think alcohol drinking is wonderful. We don't need a pastor's opinion. We need a pastor who's in alignment with Scripture. Hey, y'all, this is Troy Black. The Holy Spirit recently spoke to me a prophetic message about Christians drinking alcohol. As Christians, we should never say, mm, girl, I need a shot, I need a drink. You never find anybody in the Bible taking shots. But the Bible is also clear that Jesus did drink. Paul says he was stoned once. Today, that means one thing, of course, but back then it meant something completely different. This is called semantic shift and it happens rather commonly in languages over time. Here are some other examples. And the question that I got is, Daniel, can a Christian drink alcohol? The existence of drunkenness or intoxication is not determined by the amount that someone drinks. The degree of drunkenness is. So, in other words, Paul is saying, don't even begin the process of intoxication. That is the force of the grammar in the original Greek. Let me get this straight. 
You saw me drinking in one video and you immediately jumped to the conclusion that I have a drinking problem. We're supposed to be sober. And by the way, those verses that I just quoted to you, look in the Greek. Did Jesus ever drink wine? That same thing has happened with the word wine. Today it means a strongly alcoholic drink. But until recently, wine regularly meant pure sweet juice or vinegar, as well as grapes that are still on the vine. You can follow the shift in definitions over time in the Bible, in ancient literature, as well as the oldest English dictionaries ever made. The Bible is very clear. Drunkenness is a sin. They say that godliness is unattainable until you stop drinking beer. I think alcohol drinking is wonderful. The diversity among Christians on the issue of alcohol is so wide and so far apart, it is hard to believe that they worship the same God. If God provides wisdom, and the Bible is clear in its teaching, how could there be such a diverse difference? Now, some will say part of it is culture. Some people love big German shepherds, and some people love chihuahuas. Some people love big dogs and little dogs. Say hi, Flo. Hello. We will hear, we will hear Christians universally agree that drunkenness is a sin. But there is no defining of what drunkenness means among those that think that drinking is a liberty that Christians may enjoy. There are many Christians that argue alcohol is so dangerous that the only wise decision is total abstinence. There will be other Christians that argue the joys and benefits of alcohol should be enjoyed. The diversity among opinions seems strange to an outsider who is told that God grants wisdom to those that ask and that the Bible is his clear teaching on how to live in this world. So this is a study I've never done before and I've never heard before. Okay, you wonder where I get these questions from. <laughs> Out of the thousands and thousands of Bible studies I've heard, I've never heard a study where the goal is what my goal is today, which is what the Bible really says about alcohol. I think it's commanded in the Old Testament. De Deuteronomy says... Whenever you're going to talk about a major lifestyle issue, you should trace what the Bible teaches all the way from Genesis to Revelation. You shouldn't just cherry pick. I challenge you to go look at Deuteronomy chapter 14, where J.P. Moreland has instructed a group of university students that God commands them to drink. In Deuteronomy 14, you will also find commandments on what you are allowed to eat. And you shouldn't focus primarily on the Old Testament without considering what the New Testament might have to say. The reason is we believe in progressive revelation. But I am one who advocates what the Bible says being spoken of accurately. Jesus turned water into wine, and drinking wine was not considered a sin. As we'll see, there's going to be a lot of references to the Greek or the Hebrew or what the words really mean. And there's a great argument among Christians. This next clip is going to make a very compelling case that the word wine, as used back in the day, meant grape juice. The ripe grapes is called vinum, wine. The juice of the grape is called wine. The new world of English words. Must, Latin, wine, newly pressed from the grape. Glossographica Anglicana Nova, must, sweet wine, newly pressed from the grape. Then in the 18 and 1900s, the definition began to shift. When Thomas Bramwell Welch invented a method of pasteurizing grape juice so that fermentation was stopped. And for the first time in history, it was possible to have non-alcoholic grape juice. The idea that alcohol is sinful originated around the time when Welch invented non-alcoholic grape juice. Up until that point, there was no stigma about drinking alcohol. Webster's International Dictionary of the English Language of 1898 says wine, the expressed juice of grapes, especially when fermented, a beverage or liquor prepared from grapes by squeezing out their juice and usually allowing it to ferment. Hope you came for some preaching. What does the Bible say about alcohol? Is drinking a sin? Drinking is not a sin. What does the Bible say? The Bible very plainly says drunkenness is wrong. About alcohol, 
and social drinking. He claims there's no way exegetically around the fact that this was alcoholic wine. So the guests at the wedding in John chapter 2 are clearly upset that the wine is gone. When's the last time you were at a wedding and your uncle got angry because they ran out of grape juice? Why is rum gone? So I just don't understand where exactly he's getting that claim. In fact, up until Welch's grape juice was invented, the church always used wine for communion. Uh, now, I'll be honest with you to give you something of an idea of my idealism. When I graduated from Dallas Seminary, uh, it was almost beyond my imagination to think that two godly individuals could strongly disagree. This is my silly boy. Hey, silly boy. So for those of you that would criticize me or try to point fault with saying, well, of course, you know, Christians disagree on things like that's natural or that would be expected. Um, undoubtedly, even if you disagree with some of his uh, positions on doctrine, Charles, Charles Swindoll was a well-respected Christian. He's certainly very well educated. Now, in that last clip, he points out the very argument that I am pointing out here in that if Christians believe that the scripture is good for understanding life and understanding God's message, and that if they pray for wisdom, God will grant it, and that's what the scripture says, then two honest, God-fearing men or women who pray for wisdom and read the scripture should not have a sharp disagreement about any major topic or even i mean maybe in the very minor things it would make sense but on big things like drinking alcohol or the trinity or okay cut all that that doesn't matter some of us like silly huh silly dog what do you say silly dog hmm what do you say <laughs> Do you like to fight, huh, Shili? No, don't worry. Me and Silly made up. Even best friends can have fights, huh, Silly? So he's got a he. He's a street dog that we rescued just a couple months ago, and he's got a bad neurological problem. Uh, we think he's a Chiwini, half, like the two worst breeds to mix, a Chihuahua and a, and a wiener dog, a, a, a salchicha, as they say in Mexico. Um, so he has a neurological disease. When we got him, he was like, he couldn't sit still. He would shake like he had Parkinson's disease. And But he he's, he's part of the family now. He sleeps with me and my girlfriend every single night. And even though he just attacked me and, well, he didn't draw, he didn't draw blood, did you, buddy? Even though he attacked me, he went crazy because we were growling at each other. And, and uh, we still love each other, don't we, buddy? Okay. Uh, and I, I really did believe that if the Spirit of God is at work in both lives and uh, the Lord is the one who wants us to have a relationship that is harmonious and uh, kind toward one another, the whole idea of a sharp disagreement seemed impossible to me. Silly dogs is watching TV with the other dogs. This is Zoe. Zoe's another street rescue dog. I'm going to insert a clip right now. Okay, that that poor pathetic picture was was Zoe just um, a couple months ago on the street. So Jessica, my girlfriend, found her like that and she was dog number seven in the house like with seven dogs is insanity so silly dog was number six i think she's part uh uh, uh belgian shepherd maybe maybe she also sleeps with us every night but i can't fall in love with her because uh seven dogs is too much so we actually took her to the vet today to get some shots so she's all up to date on her vaccinations and she's going to a new home next week we found her a rescue family okay back to our regularly scheduled program hi Flo. Flo Flo's a good girl she's very mellow um, let I want just want to do a, a quick reminder of what um, Chuck Swindoll just said seemed impossible to me so 
my point here is I'm not crazy by saying, wait a minute, in light of the high priestly prayer where Jesus prays for the unity of the church, and in light of the fact that God says he gives wisdom to those who ask for it, and in light of the fact that scripture says it's good for reproving and teaching and living life, how can these sharp disagreements happen if the Holy Spirit really speaks to you and the Holy Spirit Spirit really speaks to the other guy that is 180 degrees different from you? A, how is that possible? And B, why should anyone trust anything a Christian says about any subject when you all can't agree with each other? I think that's a fair question. What's the Bible say about drinking alcohol? Bottom line, the Bible says it's okay to drink, but drink responsibly. Okay, call me a cynical old atheist, but come on, guys. When your Christian message sounds exactly like a government PSA, it's time to stop and rethink things. It's a legitimate question to say, okay, the Bible says don't get drunk. What does that mean? What, what's the biblical definition of drunk? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul identifies drunkenness not as an end, but as a process. How so? The word drunk is an inceptive verb in the Greek. An inceptive verb is a special kind of verb that shows a process of beginning or becoming. An example of an inceptive verb that we use today is the word thaw. Imagine you had chicken in the freezer. That chicken is not thawed. When does that chicken begin the process of thawing out? When the meat is taken out of the freezer, it begins the process of thawing. You believe in science, right? Not the Bible. To draw the parallel, instead of some chicken in the freezer, imagine a person that has not had any drinks. He is sober. That person has not begun the process of becoming drunk. When does that process begin? When a toxin is ingested, that person begins the process of drunkenness or intoxication. I mean, this is so nice. How can anyone drink beer? Well, Bethany, we don't need to see that fun you because it almost got you killed last night. That's the simple meaning of the word. The more intoxicant that is ingested, the further into the state of drunkenness they get. The drunkenness doesn't begin at some late stage of drinking. Drunkenness begins when the first drink is taken and continues from there. People today redefine drunkenness as a late stage of intoxication. But Paul identifies drunkenness as a process. When someone starts drinking, they begin the process of drunkenness. God wants us to be able to minister to others. If God wants us to be available 24 hours a day that if somebody were to call and say, hey, I'm hurt, I need prayer. You're in the house, just one beer, just one beer. And all of a sudden, a family member knocks on your door. You're only drinking one beer. You're a one wine, one beer kind of guy. You're not in sin. All right, let's just, let me humor you. And your family member knocks on the door and goes, hey, I've been witnessing to my cousin and will you pray for them? Will you baptize them? Will you share the gospel with them? They're at your door knocking. And you, you, you smell like beer. And you're at the door and your cousin brought one of their friends that they've been witnessing to. And they're like, hey, will you baptize? Will you pray for them? Will you? And you're gonna pray for them with, with beer breath? You're gonna pray for them smelling like Bud Light? Come well, let's be honest here. I was a Christian for 38 years. There was never no time nobody's knocking on my door on a late on a Friday night saying, yo, I got my cousin over here want to be baptized in your backyard pool. Oh, come on. Look, I was active in the church. I was in lay leadership. This scenario he just uh, mentioned never happens. I'm going to read you two quotes. One is by Tony Evans and one by Max Lucado. Alcohol consumption is not completely condemned in the Bible. Max Lucado. One thing for sure, I have never heard anyone say, a beer makes me more Christ-like. Fact of the matter is this, people don't associate beer with Christian behavior. And I want to share with you my personal, but it's not only the person. I know a lot of people hope hold this case and reasons for total abstinence from alcohol, wine, and beer. Number one, alcohol does not deliver what it promises. Amen. All right. This, this is another unrealistic thing. And I can understand how the, the teetotalers kind of frustrate the Christian libertines. Al alcohol is not a person... It can't promise anything. The second reason, 
that I abstain from alcohol and I would encourage you to do, to, to do as well is that God does not lead us into evil. He delivers us from it. Well, yes, God delivers you from evil according to your scripture, but the libertines are saying that sometimes drinking alcohol can be a blessing. That's the argument. You can't say don't drink because God delivers you from evil unless you're going to argue that alcohol is always evil. Now today's question is, is alcohol a sin? Now short answer is no. So pack it up. We're done. We can go home. Shortest video I've ever made. Now after all the verses you read, would you think alcohol is for your soul or against your soul? If it's against your soul, then what did God tell you to do? Abstain. Abstain. Not moderate. Abstain. All right. I just want to say as a grumpy old atheist, that I actually like that last pastor. Like, I don't agree with his worldview, but I think he has a good heart. He's going to make a strong case on why avoiding alcohol completely is the right thing to do. And he'll do it in, a, in a, both a humorous and a serious way. I just want to give props where props are due. If I was going to go to church, I'd want to go to a church with a bunch of guys like this that have dogs and guns and shoot. That's the kind of church I want to go to. If I was going to be a Christian and afterwards, I'd go with all my friends to the Waffle House. Hey, I'm not mocking this guy. No, he's he, I, I don't agree with him, obviously, being an atheist. Um, but I, I it, it, if you're on the other side of this argument, uh, this guy makes some good points and and he gives he preaches a good message make it out to be. And please don't be one of those people that basically says their alcohol back then was not the same alcohol as today. To say that you really have to bend the scripture so much, you're practically making origami. What it means is you, go, you can go find this online and study this yourself. A careful study of the Mishnah and Talmud shows that the normal dilution rate among the Jews was three parts water to one part wine. You're practically making origami. This dilution rate reduces the alcohol content of the New Testament wine to 2.75 to 3% by volume. See, the scriptures actually say that it's a gift from God. It makes life enjoyable. It can make your heart merry. Psalm 104, Ecclesiastes 3, Ecclesiastes 9. The problem with this conclusion is that the passages counting wine as a blessing do so without regard to moderation. In the passages that condemn wine, do so in any amount. Jesus obviously drank wine throughout his ministry. It's instituted in the Last Supper. His first miracle was turning water into wine. If, if when I say, what does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? If your answer is, or the thought that comes to your mind is, didn't Jesus turn water into wine? Or Jesus turned water into wine? I'm gonna ask you a question and then you can zone out until the message is over and then I'll, I'll check back in with you and you can see if you come up with an answer. Tell me under what conditions and by what process water ferments. You got an answer for that? You get back to me. His first miracle was turning water into wine. You believe in science, right? Not the Bible. That's what you say. Well, I don't believe in the Bible. I believe in science. Okay, you just let me know. You let me know the process by which water ferments. Every fermented drink must have started out as an anodyne sweet beverage before any fermentation could have started. It could become fermented, but to assume that it exclusively or always meant this is literally incorrect. We even denote the ambiguity of cider by saying cider or hard cider. This is the same flexibility that Shakar has. Just as wine is a general word for all types of beverages made from grapes, fermented and unfermented, shakar seems to indicate juices made from other fruit. The New King James Version regularly renders it as similar drink. Second. There is plenty of evidence to support the fact that the wine that Jesus drank and created was alcoholic. I know, you know two things in the Bible. Jesus turned water into wine and judge not lest you be judged. And you're wrong about both of them. So. While the Bible is clear about alcohol, it's even more clear about judging others. Get the log out of your own eye. Now, some of you spend $72 a day on ammo. I, I get that, but that's, that's not the average. One out of 18 people who take a drink will become an alcoholic. The negative consequences of alcohol in society is pretty indisputable. The problem with this line of reasoning is that X number of people who 
own or possess guns will commit a crime or commit suicide. X number of people that drive cars will end up in car accidents and die. X number of people that have swimming pools will have a children drown and die. Hey, honey, you're really cute. All right. <clears throat> this next point he's making is a lot more valid. Drinking tends to make you stupid. I can testify to this. Now, uh, yep, you're looking pretty good. Oh, I'm noticing you too. You weren't 45 minutes ago. 45 minutes ago, she wasn't cute and you hadn't noticed him. Brothers and sisters, I want you to open your Bibles right now to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Now read along with me. Mark it in your Bibles. What does it say right there, brothers and sisters? Do not get drunk on wine. Okay, <clears throat> in hours of watching teachings and preachings on alcohol, Ephesians 5 comes up by pretty much everybody. Like almost every pastor, teacher has to say, now the Bible is very clear not to get drunk, Ephesians 5.18. Yeah, okay, so the, what the, what is the real argument then? The real argument is, can you drink socially or anything other than maybe communion um, and not be on some degree of drunkenness? That's that really seems to me like the argument you'd have to take. So again, at sitting back and looking at this as an atheist, it's it's indicative of the fact that the things you guys say you believe in just can't possibly be true. If you guys, if you all can't get down to some agreement on this issue, why should I trust anything you have to say? The idea that the, the Lord in the middle, the one that was proclaimed by the forerunner and the one that was proclaimed by the apostle, where would you get the idea that the forerunner and the apostle didn't drink, the one they're preaching about did? You called him a wine-bibber, his enemies. Legalists often resort to these kind of tactics when they don't have real arguments. They did the same thing to Jesus when he drank alcohol. And if you got ministers standing in pulpits today saying Jesus was a wine-bibber, they're just testifying they're his enemies. Well, how do you know he didn't drink? He says he's a wine-bibber and, and, and he kept company with harlots. I'd be real careful using that wine-bibber thing to mean Jesus drank. Because it'd be pretty blasphemous to say he did the other. Then why isn't it blasphemous to say he did the one? Well, I hear you, Pastor, but I read this book by Dan Brown, and it said Jesus was married. This is very important. Let me, I want you to write this down. Whatever I do in moderation my kids will do an excess. Good word, Brother Isaiah, you're preaching strong tonight. But again, on the flip side, I know a good bottle of wine, a good meal, sitting around the table with friends, there's something sacred and beautiful about that. We'd be working so hard to keep these young people out of the world, and that people be going around behind our backs saying, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking, as long as you just drink a little bit, and as long as it's just wine, I mean, Jesus turned water into wine. I know a good bottle of wine, a good meal, sitting around the table with friends. There's something sacred and beautiful about that. <sighs> Does this kid even look old enough to know what sacred is? I'm going to have to go with the old guy. Uh, the bottom line, uh, you know, like I don't, obviously I don't agree with either side because I'm an atheist, but let me give you a little bit of a hint. I've thrown many wild parties and I was always happy when the beautiful young women had the attitude that sharing a bottle of wine led to beautiful things. I'll take it from me. If you, if you are advocating Christian libertinism, like good old J.P. Moreland telling kids at a university that it's God's commandment to drink because of Deuteronomy 14. You all, you all, you know what Jesus said about a millstone around your neck if you lead these young ones to sin? Well, that's what you're doing when you tell them it's okay to drink. I think alcohol drinking is wonderful. Drinking. Okay. So as Christians, 
Can we, you know, I mean, that's a rock. That that you know that that Hennessy. He said, "Can we, you know, what I mean? that's a rock." <laughs> that that uh, you know, Casamigos. Can, 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 can we can we drink as like um, Christians? What does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? Let's let's get into it. Yes. <laughs> you have the Greek terminology. The Greek word used in the Gospel of John when Jesus turns water into wine is the same Greek word that Paul uses in Ephesians when he commands us to not get drunk on wine. Oh, for wine versus strong wine drinks. versus strong drinks. No. Okay. Second thing it's, that is important is the word wine. So both in the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament. Uh, the term wine could cover all the juice from the grape, uh, whether it's fermented or not fermented. Now, we might consider that in the majority of cases, it's referring to fermentation. I have to grab it. Because I hate to say some without providing. Yeah, like, sure. we we are of the generation where you got to provide receipts, right? No, 100%. I hate to put something out there and not have receipts. But And again, this is unbiased research. It's what did they do in those days? Well, all right. And all the times that I was watching, the hours of watching this stuff, the number of times somebody said, well, you can look this up or it's unbiased research or this is the way it was or Jesus undoubtedly turned water into alcoholic wine. Jesus undoubtedly wow. turned water into grape juice. Your, the incredible confidence that Christians have in completely opposite things is yet another indicative piece of evidence about how we should treat trish Christian truth claims. And when they start bringing up the Greek and the Hebrew, you know, you're just going to get their opinion from some teacher because none of these, none of, none of all you people went and studied Greek for 10 years in college or university. None of y'all have a PhD in Greek. If you want to know somebody that understands Greek, then you got to go listen to Bart Ehrman or somebody like that. Otherwise, all you're doing is parroting somebody else's opinion. And that's what these are. These are opinions. And how do I know they're opinions? Because when one guy says, I love Jesus, I'm giving you my unbiased opinion, and I prayed, and I got the spirit, and I prayed for wisdom, and I studied this. And then he tells you the exact opposite thing that the other guy just told you, who also made the same claim. He's unbiased. He studied. He knows the Greek. He studied the words. The bottom line is you all are believing what you want to believe, just like everything else. If you find something you want to do, you find a way the Bible endorses it. There is a difference in the Greek and Hebrew language of wine versus strong drink. Well, what Beyonce say, drunk in love, I'm saying. That's a good question. You ever wondered about that? Well, Jesus turned water into wine, so clearly he's not against alcohol. So Jesus does a great miracle by turning water into fresh fruit juice. And it was better, more fresh, better tasting than the other juice that they had had before, which is exactly what the whole story is. There is no insinuation here that anyone has gotten drunk, is getting drunk, is enjoying alcohol. That is coming from a perverted mind, from perverted hearts that want to justify drinking that. Wine in the first century had alcohol in it, and alcohol is something that is not a sin to drink. Drinking, because it's the topic of the video, it's not sinful, and I know it'll trigger fundamentalists like this guy into saying irrational things and resorting to character assassination. We're supposed to be sober. And by the way, those verses that I just quoted to you, look in the Greek. It's, it's interesting, because the word sober literally means to abstain from wine. Christians ought to remain sober and not even start the process of drunkenness, just as the Bible says. People need to realize that alcohol is something that we should not play with. It's not just another beverage. Alcohol is a drug. It's a mind and mood altering chemical. And we have to be aware of that fact. People are treating it uh, without taking into consideration what it is, what it really is. Okay.
Today, we are talking about alcohol. Now, for those who think that it is okay, their quick argument usually sounds something like, well, Jesus drank wine. To which those who do not believe it's okay usually reply, it was not wine. It was simple grape juice. Well, wait a second. Why would Paul command us to not get drunk on wine that is not alcoholic that we couldn't get drunk on? Be careful, Tommy. Don't get bitten by that stuffed tiger. All, All right, well, I gotta say, I, I enjoy this character. Um, he's he's entertaining. I, I don't think he's as serious as the uh, as the other preacher that I like the the guy the southern guy. Um, but all that to be said. Okay, okay I'm going to tread really carefully here, but there's two groups that I don't understand why they would be Christians. Uh, well, there's more than two groups, but two main groups. One is is gay you know, whether homosexual men or, or lesbian or bisexuals or anybody in the LGBT alphabet category. Like, why are you all Christians? I, I Like, I don't get it. Have you read the Bible? Do you know what most Christians think about you? I just don't get it. Now, the other group, I'm going to quote Chris Rock, and I'll just let him speak for himself. When you're black, there's like, there's, there's like no religion to turn to. It's like Christianity? I don't think so. White people justified slavery and segregation through Christianity. So a black Christian is like a black person with no effing memory. This is from an this is an outtake from a 1989 doc, documentary short who is Chris Rock. And he's got a really, really valid point here. I, I mean, no disrespect to black Christians, but seriously, I don't, I honestly don't get it. Um, is it a sin to drink alcohol? Well, if Jesus is who we say he is, the sinless son of God, and he drank wine, then signs point to no. Well, I don't think you all have made the case that Jesus actually drank wine, like in the way you all mean, like drank like drinking. And also as a sidebar, just because Jesus did something doesn't mean that's something that a Christian should do. Otherwise you would all be unmarried apocalyptic preachers purposely out to piss off the government to get crucified. Nowhere in the Bible does it absolutely prohibit the consumption of alcohol. Well, fair enough, but it also doesn't prohibit drug use. So do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, honor God with your body. I think it's commanded in the Old Testament. De <laughs> Deuteronomy says, if you make the argument that the Bible does not prohibit the drug alcohol, you must also therefore concede there is no direct prohibition against recreational drugs, which as an atheist, hey, I'm all for that. I think more people should do psychedelics because it makes them better people. Psychedelics open up your mind and just make you so much of a better person. And also like things like mushrooms are used for depression and migraine headaches. Um, in fact, the government's approved trials now for things for like MDMA and so forth, uh, ketamine for um, post post traumatic stress syndrome and stuff and stuff like that. However, once you open that door, just know what door you are opening. One thing still doesn't make sense. So Jesus not only drank wine, but he gave people wine. And he gave it in abundance. Didn't Jesus know that those people could abuse it and fall into sin? Why would he do that? Why you gotta tempt me like that, Jesus? It looks like you're making the case for the teetotalers here because if Jesus is passing out wine in abundance, it's either grape juice are very low alcohol content or this passage from James 113 oh, I'm gonna do it in my pastor voice if you don't mind when tempted no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone so it, the, the obvious answer to your question is, is you're not understanding something because or the Bible is contradictory and confusing. 
got you there. With and that's my point. I mean, in all seriousness, that's my in all seriousness, that's my point here. Like, I don't think this guy is trying to mislead people and send you know teenagers to their deaths and drunk driving accidents. I, I mean, I really don't think that about him. I just think that he's picked what he's you know logically felt was right, just like the teetotalers are picking what they think's logical. <laughs> Right. And everybody's everybody's saying, I love Jesus and I prayed for wisdom and I've read the Bible and, you know, I've gone online and studied that you can study this for yourself. Many people have said in this in this conversation. And yet and yet you guys are still in in your like miles apart. Take that to its logical conclusion. Well, if we rewind, we'll actually see that throughout the Bible, the consumption of alcohol is often connected with the covenant promises of God. In the Old Testament, wine was a blessing from God, and the absence of wine was actually a curse. Wine was also a sign of favor and the promise of God's presence for the Israelites. This is why Jesus chooses his first miracle to be turning water into wine. He is announcing God's favor is here. God's covenant promises have all been fulfilled in me. This is why Jesus points to wine as a metaphor for his blood poured out on the cross. Not so we can turn up and go crazy, but because his blood was a sign of God's favor, blessing, and presence for all mankind. Which is why the question is, is it wise for a Christian to drink? Yeah, this pastor seems like a pretty cool, cool guy too. He seems like a cool guy to go have a beer with, other than he apparently doesn't drink, even though he starts off by saying it's not a prohibition. So there's a weird irony here. So some of the Christians arguing that drinking isn't a sin, like that's one of the things this guy started off with, like drinking is not a sin. But then he spent the whole sermon explaining why if you have two brain cells to rub together, you shouldn't drink. For a reason, 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 like he quotes Huberman. And hey, look, my daughter is in getting her master's in neuroscience. She's, she's a huge fan of Huberman. And she got her boyfriend to like cut back on drinking because she said, like, this stuff basically kills your brain cells. So even atheists like get it. Like, they, uh, when you're an atheist, you just kind of think, you know what? I got one life to live. I'm going to have some fun. If I kill a few brain cells, so what? Because by the time I'm 70 or 80 years old, you know, who cares if I'm smart? So actually, the only proper way based on scripture to partake in a glass of alcohol is to do it as a way to pay tribute and honor to the Savior. Jesus himself said this in the Gospel of Luke as he raised a glass of wine and said, do this in remembrance of me. Yeah, I don't know if a, if a lot of Christians are going to buy onto this. This Last Supper was like a party fest. I seem to remember reading the Bible that the Last Supper was like, you know, this guy's going to betray me and I need to wash your feet. No, Jesus, don't wash my feet. Hey, if, if I don't wash your feet, you, you got no part of me. Okay, wash my whole body. Let me get naked. That's how I read the Last Supper. It, it, so if, if this guy's thing is the only way you should enjoy alcohol is if you're – if you're doing communion or doing something in reverence, yeah, okay, but I don't know. I mean, let's see what a Catholic priest has to say about it. And I can just picture Tolkien and C.S. Lewis um, sitting there with you know a pint of some kind of beer, and it always has this sort of great romantic idea in my head of just these these friends gathered together with a couple beers and just like becoming closer and closer friends and becoming better and better fellow Christians with each other. You know, there are some Christians who say, absolutely not, I can't drink at all. There's also a lot of Christians that think buggery is off the table. Enough said with that. As a sidebar, there were two books that helped me when I was doubting Christianity and I wanted to know what to do. One of them was Dawkins' famous book, The God Delusion. The second one, which was very impactful because it was personable, was William Lobdell's book, an ex-Catholic who was a reporter for the Los Angeles Times on 
the religious abuses of the Catholic Church against minors. And what he found so disgusted him, he dug deeper and ended up an atheist. And his book was very impactful and helpful for me. Um, I, you know, look, with, with all due respect, I, I put Catholics in the same group that I put black Christians and gay Christians. I don't get you. I don't, how can you support the things you support? If you're a Catholic, I understand the tradition. I understand the, the history. I, you know, like I'm not saying everything about Catholicism is necessarily evil, but at its core, the Catholic church is a very evil institution. And to support it is to support what evil people have done and continue to do to children. I don't get it. No alcohol, absolutely. Um, as Catholics, we say, no, wine, beer, those spirits, as they say, um, alcohol is a good, it's a gift. In fact, Psalm 104 says, you know, wine gives warmth to men's hearts. Jesus at the wedding feast of Cana turned the water into wine. You all realize that John was written decades and decades and decades later and this wedding at Cana with the wine miracle didn't happen. You realize that, right? Like it's it's nowhere it's nowhere recorded anywhere but John, written in the '90s or the or the the second century even. And guess where it came from? We drink to enjoy the presence of our friends, and we drink to enjoy the moments that God has given us and to give glory to him by our joy because God takes joy in our joy. Christians and alcohol. Can anybody in here tell me what the Jewish household went around their house trying to get rid of during Passover? Anybody know? Shout it out. Leaven. What ingredient do you need to turn grape juice into wine? Oops, leaven. Let's first consider whether or not there is a commandment in the Bible prohibiting drinking alcohol. If God considered drinking alcohol a sin, we can reasonably expect that to be clear in the scriptures. After all, the Bible unambiguously prohibits the consumption of meat from certain animals like pigs and shellfish. Yeah, take that J.P. Moreland, who quotes Deuteronomy 14 to tell university students, some of which are not even 21, that God commands them to drink? I think it's commanded in the Old Testament. Dude, <laughs> Deuteronomy says... Somehow forgot to read the rest of the, that chapter, like, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk, don't eat pork or shrimp cocktail, shrimp salad, barbecue shrimp, lemon shrimp, coconut shrimp, Pepper shrimp, shrimp soup, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger, shrimp sandwich. That's, that's about it. Unless you cherry pick, like J.P. Moreland did, to the detriment of young Christians who are impressionable and think that he's a good leader, instead of a stumbling block who led them into grievous sin, if the rest of these people are right. Well, which is it? Surely, if consuming certain drinks were an offense to God, the Bible would clearly prohibit it like it does consuming certain meats. It's not like alcoholic drinks were unknown in the ancient world. Wine was safer than water in the first century. Now, let me just, and, you, and Lynn, all this stuff you can search online yourself if you're, if you're interested. And the Most believers, even fundamentalist Baptists who generally oppose drinking alcohol, will admit that there is no direct commandment against it. Sobriety and being a drunkard, not between alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic quote-unquote wine. The reason for this is that the biblical authors were not concerned with the type of drink being consumed, but with the outcome. Again, it's not the alcohol that's the problem, but the abuse of it. In conclusion, does the Bible permit drinking alcoholic beverages? Yes. Wine, beer, and other fermented drinks are gifts from God intended to bless us. We are free to enjoy them if we choose, but we should consume them wisely. There are times and places when we shouldn't drink alcohol. 
So this guy says don't eat pork and don't eat shrimp, but go ahead and booze up because God wants to bless you. It makes no logical sense. Like I'm not our I I'm not arguing whether his argument is right or not. I'm just saying use your brain. Does that make any sense? Does it make any sense to you that you shouldn't eat pork and you shouldn't eat sh uh sorry, I have a speech impediment. Sh shell 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 shellfish. You shouldn't eat shellfish. She sold seashells by the seashore. Does that make any sense? Whiskey, no problem. Wine, no problem. Beer, no problem. But don't have a shrimp cocktail. Have a Tom Collins instead. Bless my heart, Jesus. You know, you, you ever wonder why, I mean, you if you all are evangelicals, you know this, but it's like, dear Lord, bless his food to our bodies. Sweet Jesus. They always got to say Jesus. Why, why is that? I don't know. It's kind of weird. Let's carry on. Our next, the next guy we have coming up has a word. Like, <laughs> now this is great. He knows the Bible is confusing about all this stuff, but don't worry. This brother has your back because the Holy Spirit told him directly the right answer. Pay attention. So this is the word I heard from the Holy Spirit on June 14th. What I saw was a vision of a decanter that was full. And then it looked like wind was being sucked into it. I saw wind being sucked into the top of this decanter. Okay, imagine how deluded you have to be to think that there's all these hundreds and thousands of teachers and pastors who went to Bible school or university, read the scripture, learned Greek, learned Hebrew, and you're going to tell everybody what God's stance on alcohol is because he personally delivered the message to you. So I'm going to pray against that too. Satan, you get your hands off. You get your mouth away from people's ears right now in Jesus' name. In case you're doubting or in case you might be having his message blocked, he's going to pray to bind Satan so that you don't have the message from him blocked. I want to pray too. Dear Lord Jesus, when you prayed the high priestly prayer, Lord Jesus, you said you were you were wanting the church to be unified, like you and your father are unified, so that the world would know that he sent you. And Jesus, Jesus, the, the church isn't unified, Lord Jesus. And the world has a right to reject you, Jesus, because the church is not unified. So I want to pray right now. I want to pray against Satan. I want to pray that Satan will be bound so that the church will be unified on this division over alcohol in the name of Jesus. You don't get to spread lies of condemnation any longer over my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that they would just receive freedom in Jesus' name right now. All right, what's up with the, in Jesus' name? I mean, come on. You know what this is? It's like a, these voice inflections and the manipulation of language is a way to manipulate people. Um, and look, you know what? I get it because I was there. I was once part of you all. And I prayed in tongues and I love Jesus. And when I prayed, I would say, in Jesus' name. Of course, not in California. We would pray more like with, without the accent. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. No, we wouldn't say it like that. We would say, how do you say it in California? In Jesus' name. Well, especially if you're at a church that, that prays with force. But, like, I don't mean to mock, but I just want to point out how silly some of this is. This is a major argument that the church has argued about, and it, there's stuff all over. And this guy goes online, and he says, no, the God told me personally. 
the problem is, and I keep repeating this, hoping to drive this point home, that you guys don't agree on alcohol in the same way you don't agree on every single doctrine you could possibly name. And bringing up the, the farewell prayer or the high priestly prayer um, is not without purpose. The purpose of that, and I'm, I'm being really serious here, like no, no joking, and like read the high priestly prayer for yourself and ask yourself, did God answer Jesus' prayer? And also ask yourself, does the world have not only a right, but does the world have an obligation to reject the idea that Jesus was sent by God? Because Jesus said, make the church unified, Father, so that the world will know you sent me. Since the church is not unified, Jesus' prayer was not answered. It's fair for us in the world to reject the idea that the Father, God, sent Jesus. Because if God had sent Jesus and God answered Jesus' prayer, the church would be unified. That would be a very powerful testimony that Christianity was true. It's not ambiguous. You see, that's what the Pentecostals say. That's what the Baptists say. That's what the Catholics say. That's what the Calvinists say. That's what the Lutherans say. Not to mention that's what the Muslims say. That's what the Hindus say. If it was clear, there wouldn't be an argument among otherwise well-meaning people. So, again, I realize alcohol isn't about salvation. It isn't about ultimate truth. But just pull alcohol out of this argument and stuff in any word and be honest with yourself the video i'm not just trying to argue a point or a side i'm trying to get in scripture deep in scripture and find what does the bible actually teach well there you go folks just subscribe to this guy's channel because he knows what the bible actually teaches avio the rest of you all don't have the wisdom he's got or the channel he's got to God. If God talks to this guy direct. I would definitely subscribe to this guy's channel right away and listen to what he says because he's done a deep study and he knows. He, he knows the truth. I mean, does it, doesn't it get embarrassing at some point? Would you do that? Would you take some basil and some oregano and put it in a paper and roll it and smoke it? Well, no. And what he's, his, his broader point is you don't pay 40 or $50 for a bottle of grape juice. So his point is, is the reason that you drink is to alter your mind, to enter a different state. So he's going to argue that as a Christian, you shouldn't do that. You should let the Holy Spirit fill that emptiness and void, which is a very strong argument that a lot of the Christians are making. And again, as an atheist, it's like this is not the, the, the fight about alcohol isn't my dog. I don't have a dog in that fight. The dog that I have and the beef that I have to mix two metaphors is Christians can't agree on anything but they want to tell us how to live our lives. They want to legislate, legis, legislate laws on how we should live. And they think that they have a message about how we should change our lives based on their perception where their Christian brother that they're supposed to you know, love and be in, in unity with says the exact opposite thing. I mean, I back when I was a Christian, I lost friends over this kind of stuff. I had a friend that entered the Boston Church of Christ. You know, if you know anything about the discipleship movement, oh my gosh, it was ridiculous. The wedding at Cana. What we have to understand about that episode is as a Jew living at the time and place he did, it is safe to say that Jesus drank wine and even 
produced wine miraculously at the wedding at Cana. However, research about the customs of those times reveals the following. And again, this is unbiased research. It's what did they do in those days? Well, isn't it strange how everybody has unbiased research, but they don't agree. So take the unbiased research phrase with a grain of salt. Secondarily, you all are all biased. I'm biased myself. We are all biased. How do you get around biases? Answer, well, you can never be perfect, but if you use good methodology, Bayesian logic, Socratic questions, scientific method, and you build models and you test things, you can often, not always, but you can often get very close to what the actual truth is. Now, with, with historical things, especially from a culture and a language from 2,000 years ago, it's very difficult. So when somebody says they've done unbiased research, they're either A, lying, or B, they're just naive. They're... Here's a little bit of information. Jesus used wine as food. He was not a social drinker. Using strong drink for recreational purposes in public houses and feasts. He wasn't like that. Did he associate with sinners? Absolutely, he associated with them to bring them the gospel, but he didn't associate with them in, 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 so that he could share in their vices. On the other extreme, you can't make the case that drinking wine is a sin. So let me just say, drinking itself is not a sin. You know, the comment that the steward made, remember he said, you know, the, you, you, you gave them the, you know, your better wine at the beginning and then at the end when people have drinking, they drank and they've eaten, you know, uh, most people give the cheap wine at the end to save money. Because why? Well, after you've eaten a full meal and you've drank, you know, your taste buds are not exactly uh, ready for uh, fine dining. All right, just in case this is getting a little confusing, this last guy is arguing that the compliments on the good wine was because at the end of the meal, the taste buds are dull, that Jesus made this great wine and it tastes so great. It's kind of like the other argument that Jesus made the best juice ever. So that's the one side, Jesus made the best juice ever. It wasn't alcoholic. And then the other side says, of course, Jesus made wine that was alcoholic. Of course. Well, and so good decisions about the way you use alcohol by Christians. Now this guy's going to close with the Ben Franklin close on his congregation. If any of you ever gone to buy a car or other high ticket item, you might have come across the Ben Franklin close. The Ben Franklin close is when the car salesman or other high ticket salesman does this. Well, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Ben Franklin was one of the smartest Americans ever. And when he was facing a tough decision, what he would do is he would write a, two sides and he would write pros and cons on a piece of paper. Here, let me get that, Mrs. Smith. Now, the pros of this car, as well as good decisions about any number of topics that involve what is right or wrong for believers need to be based on facts. Well, I don't know. Maybe you all should just sign up for that other guy's channel because he hears directly from God. You won't have to go through this Ben Franklin close on any time you have a decision. Or why not just ask the Holy Spirit yourself? There's an idea. Riddle me this, Christian. Why all the hand wringing and hand waving and arguing over the Greek and the Hebrew, if you have the Holy Spirit and God promises to answer anyone who asks for wisdom. And stop. It's the right and biblical thing to do as a follower of Jesus Christ. 
Is it a sin to drink alcohol? Now the quick answer is no, it is not. However, people tend to go to one of two extremes when trying to answer this question. Either A, they'll say, you know what, a Christian is not permitted to drink alcohol under any circumstances, no matter what. And then you'll have others who will say, you know what, I'm a Christian, I can drink as much as I want as long as I don't get drunk. And so the question is, what does the Bible have to say about this topic? Interestingly enough, the Bible actually has a lot of positive things to say about drinking wine. Yeah, that's not what the other guy said. The other guy said there was actually 75 warnings in the Bible to stay away from alcohol. First of all, it was intended to be used for celebration. I think for the Jewish festivals, for Jews, I think you're correct. For Christians, however, which don't follow the Jewish holidays and celebrations, it seems that the only institution or sacrament that you would include wine in would be the Eucharist sacrament of, you know, the wine and the cracker. But that's not like drinking wine. That's like a sip. Jesus drank wine with his disciples. And as we know, he turned water into wine. So if it is a sin to drink wine, then not only did Jesus sin, but he also caused a whole bunch of other people to sin. Well, you know, when you start quoting scriptures, well, let's do a little Bible study right now, brother. Let's start with Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Uh, no, maybe that's not appropriate. Okay, let's go to Colossians 3, 22 to 25 and Colossians 4, 1. Um, this passage, no, not appropriate. Okay, 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2. No, probably not appropriate. Uh, let's study... No, we better. That's probably not a book we should probably not talk about. Uh, First Peter two eighteen to twenty. This pa oh, yeah. Well, let's put that by. Let's put this. Let's let's not talk about those scriptures right now because I don't want to be. It would be uncomfortable. See, the problem is when you start throwing scriptures around, you can pretty much justify anything anything so check yourself brother second of all it was intended by god to be used for simple enjoyment the bible says in ecclesiastes that we should eat our food and drink our wine with a joyful heart because god has already approved of what you do wine was also used for communion and so if it is a sin to drink wine then that means that every time that we commemorate the lord's death that we could potentially be sinning. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31, do not gaze at wine when it's red and it sparkles in the cup, it goes down smoothly. Look at this, wine in the end, bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. So the question is, why do you drink? You're drinking because there's a void and you're trying to fill it with wine instead of God. So don't let alcohol fill your void. Let the Holy Spirit fill your void. Bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Would you drink viper poison? <laughs> Come on. Would you drink viper poison? No. So then why are you? I just don't get it. I think it opens the door. I do. If you just have a beer on the weekends, they're going to say, dad drinks a beer. I could drink a six pack. This is very important. Let me, I want you to write this down. Whatever I do in moderation, my kids will do an excess. Good word, Brother Isaiah. You're preaching strong tonight. I think alcohol drinking is wonderful. I, I, I think God is for it. I think it's commanded in the Old Testament. Dude. <laughs> alcohol, is it a sin to drink alcohol? Should Christians drink alcohol? Should Christians drink beer, wine, harder stuff, etc., etc.? So we're going to be discussing that today. And let me... So just because he's creating that substance does not mean that he's endorsing drunkenness. But I think that makes a very, very clear point that all alcohol in and of itself is not a sin. However, we can say the same thing about a great many things. We can say the same things about sugar and fat and fast cars. And Yes, of course, anything can become an idol and anything can be used dangerously and anything can become a sin. Get that part. The question is, can alcohol be used 
even in moderation, without breaking other commandments, without going down the road of drunkenness, without causing other people to stumble. And the ultimate question is, is the liberty of drinking worth the damage and cause that it causes and the ripple effect? That's the question. And at the end of the day, I'm not arguing alcohol is a sin because I don't believe sin is a real thing. But what I'm pointing out is you guys have such a confused mess about this, it undermines your credibility in every other subject. And I do think culture applies in a couple different ways. One of the ways that it does apply, you know, and to Shay, to your point, if people really want to have a conversation about issues with alcohol, when it comes to the, at least the, the biblical perspective, is there is something to be said for the level of potency that we see in, in modern drinks. Uh, there were strong drinks. There were things in biblical times that had a higher alcohol content than wine. But insofar as I know, they didn't have anything like uh, something like we would consider Everclear, where you've got an alcohol percentage that's just extraordinarily high. There, There is a... But I want to make this case right out the gate. There is a significant difference today between the distillation process of hard liquors like vodka, whiskey, and bourbon, and the wine of Jesus' day. And that's going to be a big point I'm going to drive home in a moment. You're practically making origami. We pause our regular day program for a little anti-Semitic Jew bashing. Please forgive me. As a sidebar, I am a Jew by birthright. I'm also half white trash on my dad's side, but through my mother and my bloodline, I am a Jew. As a further sidebar, I was walking the dogs with my girlfriend one day down the street called Chapultepec in Guadalajara, and I saw a couple guys wearing yarmulkes, so I started chatting with them. Like, you never see Jews in Guadalajara, at least not very frequently. We struck up a conversation, had a couple beers with them. One thing led to another. <laughs> Follow, check out this video. This is what alcohol does to you. <laughs> it's like I'm getting a uh, blood transfer. It's like a bar mitzvah. Ah, it's like a bar mitzvah. Yeah, it's like a bar mitzvah. You want a beer to, to celebrate it? Yeah, why not? <laughs> All right, let's, well, let's say give, I, I give you some beer. Let's say. So I can remember what I'm doing. Baruch. Baruch. Ata. Ata. Adonai. Adonai. Eloheinu. Eloheinu. Melech. Melech. Aolam. Aolam. Asher. Asher. Kiddushanu. Kiddushanu. Be mitzvotav. Be mitz. Be mitz. Votav. Votav. Be tzivanu. Be tzivanu. Now, for the record, I told these guys I was an atheist, but because I'm a Jew, they wanted to do this ceremony and I agreed and I had a really nice time. We had a few beers afterwards. They were very friendly. We talked about history. It was a very, very cool memory and I'm very happy I did that. Obviously, I don't think it meant anything, but they did and I was happy to be part of something that they thought was cool. So, In the Old Testament, people didn't receive the Holy Ghost. They didn't have inward power uh, to overcome sin and fully do God's will. So God led them step by step. Again, I apologize for leaving in that little snippet of Jew bashing, but I think it's fair to point out when it happens. So people can be aware of it. And if you can't figure out why that comment he just made wasn't bigotry and racism, you need to check yourself. You stop and think about it for a minute, about what he actually just said. It's that kind of attitude that led to the Holocaust. That kind of attitude that's led to racism. And tied in with that, that same attitude is what led to slavery. What was the logic with slavery? Well... The blacks weren't capable of receiving the Holy Spirit the way the whites were. Just like he just said, the Jews weren't capable of receiving the Holy Spirit the way the Christians were. It's bigotry and it's racism and it needs to be pointed out because it's disgusting. But actually in Hebrew, there are more, and in Greek, there are, there are several different words that have different connotations. 
Now, if you all are paying attention, you'll see that these guys are saying the word actually a lot. It's actually this way. It's actually that way. It's actually what it says. The reason they're using that word is because in their hearts they know they're full of doo-doo. They don't actually know what it actually says. They're actually just blah, 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 blah. They're actually just as lost as everybody else that says the opposite thing that they say. Now, there is a valid point he's making here that the words mean a lot of different things. The problem is... Nobody really knows exactly what it said originally because nobody actually knows what was written down originally. Nobody knows what Jesus actually said originally. Nobody knows what the copy of 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 the copy actually said. So stop with the arrogance. Really, it's annoying. But without getting too technical, in the Old Testament, the term wine sometimes clearly meant fresh grape juice because uh, Isaiah talks about the wine in the cluster. So if you take those four principles, is it beneficial? No, it's detrimental. Could it get me under the power of something else other than God? Yes. Could it be a stumbling block to others? If nothing else, my example to children, to youth, to, to people I'm trying to win to the Lord, to people who struggle with alcohol, uh, it, it, yes, it could be a stumbling block, my example. And then finally, can I give glory to God? When I eat or drink, can I honor God and glorify God? So even if you start with the principle of Christian liberty, the exercise of pr Christian liberty, according to the guidelines in 1 Corinthians, say, in this case, the best policy is not to try moderation. The best policy is abstention because that's the only safeguard. And There's no way you can make a case from the Bible to show that drinking is a sin. Obviously, if you read the Bible, alcohol is seen predominantly throughout the Scripture in the form of wine. Uh, wine was used in the Old Testament at the Shabbat, or the Sabbath ceremony, every Friday. They drank wine at the festivals and the feast days. Uh, they drank wine at weddings. It was a part of the culture. There are actually a few cases where you don't see just wine, you see something called strong drink. The CSB translates it, interesting, as beer. And the question is, is it wise for a Christian to drink? Now, because you have freedom in Christ, it doesn't mean you could just do you, boo. <laughs> you can, I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. Your drinking can cause other people to stumble. And then after when I was eating, they come, oh, Pastor Jeff, I saw you. I just wanted to say hi and meet, you know, introduce you to my parents. And so I said in my spirit and my, right then and there, I will not drink alcohol. I just won't do it but, but because I will never know what they're thinking when they see it. And I just, when it comes to kids. If you're honest with kids and you give them the tools to think critically, I think that they end up making the best decisions they can for themselves. And honestly, you can't control people. They just go out and rebel and do the opposite anyways. It's kind of like a no-win situation. I, I mean, I mean, when you, when you get drunk, who, who, does it do any good? Well, sometimes, yes. Sometimes getting drunk with the right people in the right place. I'm not talking if you're an addict. I'm not talking if you're an alcoholic or you're, you're doing things that are destructive to your life. But sometimes... Yes, sometimes getting drunk does do you good. Sometimes it can be life-affirming and fun. Sometimes it can help you grow as a person or get closer to others. Let me quote the famous philosopher J.C. Life begins when the church ends. I'm not a fan of alcoholic beverages being consumed by anyone, but especially followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that a Christian is wise to stay away from all beverage alcohol. And uh, drinking alcohol is not so much a matter of religious or Christian liberty, it's a matter of wisdom. When Yeshua took the wine at the Last Supper, it was without a doubt an alcoholic drink. We know this because grapes are harvested in the fall and Passover is in the spring. Since the only way to preserve juice at that time was fermentation, we know without a shadow of a doubt that the wine they drank at Passover was alcoholic. Yeshua said to drink. I think alcohol drinking is wonderful. Okay, we're at the end, and as promised, I have some challenging questions for Christians. 
And I would challenge you to think about the paradoxes involved here and try to answer the questions the best you can from your own intelligence and your own critical thinking and not by parroting your favorite pastor or apologist. So here we go. Question one, as we have seen, two well-meaning disciples of Christ can have completely opposite answers to a question that they claim they've investigated using the scripture and their own relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. So the question is, how do you determine which person, which answer is the correct one, and what methodology do you use, and how is it different from the methodology that the two people that got conflicting answers used? It seems axiomatic that Christians would agree that the majority doesn't necessarily have the right op opinion on any given topic. This is especially true if you look at Pew studies and other studies that show that Christianity is approximately a third of the world's population. If you break Protestants and Catholics apart or other faiths that protect you in particular don't agree or actually true Christians, then you find yourself in a minority that's somewhere in the neighborhood of perhaps 10% or less. So axiomatically it follows that you must accept that the majority can quite often be wrong. How do you determine what is truth when we've shown in the instance of alcohol, that the methodology of using the Bible and a relationship with God leads people to the wrong conclusion a very high percentage of the time. And relying on a holy book and a relationship with a spiritual being or God leads to the wrong conclusion the majority of the time. This is axiomatic if you just simply do the math. So my question is, what methodology do you use to know that you are not in the part of the group that has been deceived or misled? Can you name a single spiritual belief that you hold to be true that you did not acquire through the same methodology used by the pastors and teachers to come to completely conflicting conclusions about alcohol use. As we saw in the Pew poll, Christians are a little under one third of the world's population. If you categorize yourself even into a smaller group, i.e. Protestant or Catholic, you're even in a smaller minority. Once inside one of those, it's likely that there is yet another group you would classify yourself as, whether Calvinist, Presbyterian, Methodist. No matter how you slice it, your belief system puts you into a small minority of all humans on the planet. So my question is, doesn't your insistence on being absolutely correct about your spiritual beliefs make you very arrogant? And if not, if your claim is you are not arrogant, you are just right because reasons, does that mean that you believe that the majority of people who have also consulted holy books, and some of them including the Bible, their own hearts, conscience, and intelligence, and claim that God has spoken to them the same way that you claim God has spoken to you? Do you believe those people are arrogant? Reading from John 17, part of the High Priestly Prayer. 
from verse 20. I do not ask for these only, he means the those present in the upper room, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which obviously includes you Christians today. Verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So this is a two-part question. The first part is, how do you explain that Jesus's prayer was ignored by the Father? And the second part of the question is, don't you agree with me that I have a right in fact, an obligation, if I want to trust Jesus' words as being somewhat wise, that he was not sent by the Father, the evidence being the disunity of the church. It seems to me that the one thing we can all agree on, the one thing we have unity in, is that disunity has ruled the church from day one. If you take the position that some disputes are minor issues that don't affect salvation, what methodology did you use to determine which doctrines are essential? And how is that methodology different? from the methodology that you used to end up in the dispute over alcohol. Okay, my final question comes in two parts. The first part is as follows. Most Christians, when looking at Old Testament actions and commandments of God, such as genocide, slavery, dietary restrictions, believe that those things were God's right as God, but they were also something that fit a certain time and they are no longer applied today. My question is, is if you were to discover that Yahweh and by extension, Jesus and the Holy Spirit as the Godhead used to command child sacrifice, in other words, an infant must be sacrificed like the heathen and pagan religion sacrificed a baby's infants to the fire. I, I think I think everybody's aware of, of that practice in 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 fact that is part of the reason that some of the genocides were justified because the other communities had very terrible practices. So so my question is very simple. If you were to discover that Jesus, Yahweh, the Godhead in the Old Testament, commanded infant sacrifices, in other words, demanded that infant children were put into a furnace and, and murdered, would that change your view at all of the God that you worship? Now, if you would be so kind as to pause the video and leave me a response in the comments on how you would feel about this before you go on to part two of the question. I would greatly appreciate that, and I would. it would really be nice if people would be honest and don't delete your answer after part two of the question. And, and be honest with yourself here. Obviously, the exercise doesn't help if you lie to yourself. Okay, so pause this and then come back. Okay, I'm going to read a couple verses from Exodus 22. Now, Exodus 22 starts off with some basic tort law, which really is um, nothing controversial. It's just a few things what happened with theft and livestock. Was When you get down to verse 16, it gets a little bit different. So in verse 16, it says, if a man seduces a virgin, uh, he has to pay a bride price. Verse 18 says, don't allow a sorceress to live. Uh, 19 is uh, you You must put to death anyone that uh, practices bestiality. 20 is anyone that sacrifices to a, a, a different God besides the Lord has to be killed. Now, 
most of those have they have excuses i'm not bringing up whether or not they were fair commandments or or not but i want to get down to verse 29 do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats you must give me the firstborn of your sons do the same with your cattle and your sheep let them stay with their mothers for seven days, but give them to me on the eighth day. I repeat, you must give me the firstborn of your sons. Now, this is a commandment for child sacrifice. I understand you're immediately going to balk at that and say, no, that means something else. Okay, so let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. This is when... God is called upon by the prophet. And what he says is, down in verse 25, So I gave them other statutes that were not good and laws through which they could not live. Verse 26, I defiled them through their gifts the sacrifice of every firstborn that i might fill them with horror so that they would know that i am the lord now i know that's going to be a little bit of a shock and you're going to want to try to find a workaround keep in mind this is god when in when i say the word i in that verse it is god speaking so i you could put in jesus here so I, Jesus, gave them other statutes that were not good and laws through which they could not live. I, Jesus, defiled them through their gifts. Remember, Jesus, in your view, is God. I, Jesus, defiled them through their gifts, the sacrifice of every firstborn. So part two of my final question is knowing that Jesus required human sacrifice of eight-day-old babies put into a fire, roasted alive. Knowing that, does that change your view at all of your sweet, kind, and merciful Savior, Jesus Christ?